Yes, she's yes, exactly. Right. But I had this is our first. We did one with. You know, I, I'm just sitting here waiting to get started. It'd be just fine. I, I do a lot of public speaking, so this is not, a, it's not a nervousness or anything like that. It's just want to get it going.
Actually, anything that you buy that's in the stores at Coastal or our retail partners that has a Malibu brand on it, we give a donation to Pam to help their organization. Um, we work with the largest beekeepers in the world, all the way down to the hobby beekeepers. Um, and our goal is to bring um, information to you guys that's real and valuable. Not, there's a lot of misinformation that's out there on the internet, and that's one of the reasons what brought us together with Pam. They are experts in the field, from entomologists to commercial beekeepers like George that have been doing this his whole life. Um, our slide went down. We'll work on that real quick and see what we can get. Um, if you go to malibo.com, on there you can find out more about our products. We carry a full line of beekeeping equipment. We are a wholesaler, so you have to get with places like Coastal Farm Supply to, uh, to get our merchandise. We also have a Facebook page that we've set up for a resource that you guys can connect with other beekeepers in your area. It's called the Art of Beekeeping in Oregon here. We actually have one of those set up for every state in the United States and every province in Canada. Um, on that page, it's nice because you, when you're into beekeeping, you can connect with uh, mentors in your area. You can also post pictures on there of your experience while you're going through your beekeeping and ask questions on, on what's going on in your hive and we have people on there that will answer. And, um, it's a great resource. Uh, so Natalie Thompson is the one that started that our beekeeping page. There's about 2,000 people in the one in Utah. I think there's about 230 people currently in the one in Oregon. We've got about 650 for people that are in Washington. So, like I said, it's a private page. We don't go on there and spam you with uh, ads and stuff. We really want it to be informal for you guys. Um, so you'll have to go on there, you ask it to join, and we'll put you on there. Um, I'll be back after George's presentation to talk about after sunny bees that are coming into Coastal if you guys are interested in getting started. Um, Without further ado, I'll just introduce George, and George will get started. Um, we'll try to work on this to get your slides going real fast, guys. Um, George, if you want to talk to him about who you are and, and what's going on, then we'll get this good. Thanks, guys. So the sign out there says I'm a master beekeeper. Um, full disclosure, uh, master beekeeper is a term which is used uh, for programs. There are several of them in the United States. There's one in Oregon. You have to go through a series of uh, lessons and activities and go through the apprenticeship and a, and a journeyman stage and then the master stage. I have not done that. So I am not, in that sense, a master beekeeper. So I became uh, a beekeeper through the back door. I was a school teacher in a program in uh, Woodburn. And uh, when my wife and I moved to, uh, to, be, to live in Woodburn, so I'd be close to work and stuff, um, we bought an old farmhouse and the, the old couple that we bought the house from actually uh, had caught a swarm of bees in an apple box, nailed the lid on it, had no frames, it, didn't, it was just a box full of bees and it nailed it to the inside of a chicken coop with an auger hole that went out so the bees could come and go. I have no idea how long it was there, but when we bought the place, we inherited a beehive. And up to that point, 
Um, I had never given a thought to keeping bees. Uh, I think I might have been stung once or twice at the park walking on uh, with barefoot, you know, and stepped on a bee or something like that, but I uh, had really never thought about it whatsoever. And when I ended up um, deciding that I didn't want to, the program I was teaching in uh, lost its funding and so I had to make a decision on what I was going to do and I decided I did, well I did, kept teaching for a while, but at any rate, any rate uh, in the interim, that one swarm in an apple box, um, we managed to kill that. Um, <laughs> and I felt terrible about it and I, fought, I bought two packages to make up for the one that I'd killed. <laughs> and um, in those days, you know, there were swarms everywhere and the you know, people had old beehives and whatnot. And it just seemed like I'd get a phone call all summer long. Uh, you want another beehive? We got a swarm. We got a, you know, there's one in the bramble patch out back or whatever. I'm killing time here <laughs> until we have some slides. Um, so before very long, I had a, a, a collection of the most uh, disreputable, ugly, rotten beehives that you can imagine and uh, hadn't really made any money from any of them. We'd made some, uh, a little bit of honey and we would give it away and whatnot. So when my teaching job disappeared, um, it was a big surprise to a lot of people that I decided I wanted to be a beekeeper um, and actually support my family <laughs> with bees because I had, didn't have a very good track record on making any money from my beehives. But at any rate, right now we, um, we run 6,000 hives of bees in three states uh, doing pollination service in uh, 20 or 30 different crops. Um, I have 10 employees and uh, we, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I went through, I, I'm past president of the American Beekeeping Federation, which is the largest beekeeping organization in the United States. I've represented the honeybee industry on the National Honey Board. I continue to, to represent the industry and other organizations. So going from that um, ugly mess of old boxes and mismatched everything and didn't know anything to where I am now is kind of a, it's been a, a pretty interesting journey. Are we close? <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to sing and I'm not going to dance. Uh. <laughs> um. <laughs> what year did you start with these? Oh, with early 70s. So. And uh, the name of my company is the Foothills Honey Company. And at the time when we registered that with the state, I thought I was going to be producing honey and selling it to, um, you know, to customers. And I had no really good idea. As it turns out, Oregon's not a terribly good place to make honey. We make some honey and it's really high quality, but the volume is not very good. And uh, so early on, as I came to places like this and did the conferences and got to know people at the university and so forth. I remember Dr. Burgett once I said, I made a special trip down there, an appointment and everything, and sat down in his office and I said, Dr. Burgett, what do I, if I want to be a successful beekeeper and support my family with my bees, what, what should I do? And he didn't hardly even swallow before he said, well, George, if you want to be successful in beekeeping, Financially, you should leave Oregon. So anyway, I didn't take that good advice and um, I've ignored a lot of other good advice in my life as well. And I expect that a lot of you will do the same thing. But as it turns out, Oregon is a uh, place that has developed a special need for honeybees and that's with pollination. Because our dry period we have lots of water, we have good soil, and because our dry season is in, in the harvest time, it's possible to raise seed crops here without having them rained on every afternoon by, like they would in the Midwest or in other parts of the country, or places 
where there isn't enough water to grow them or whatever. So uh, a seed industry and the fruit industry have developed in the Pacific Northwest and they depend on our bees to, uh, to pollinate the crop. So I didn't know that, but I learned that and that's what I do now. So um, w my two sons are taking over the business and, and they, uh, they see opportunities that I, uh, over and above that, they see that maybe there's an opportunity back into honey again because of the varietals and the price of honey is unbelievable right now in special markets. So maybe they'll do that, but they'll also, I'm sure, pay their bills by providing bees for pollination service. I'm here today because um, the person who was supposed to give this talk is working in Hawaii. Danielle Downey is the CEO of Project Apis M, and um, she wasn't able to be here, and her, the chairman of the board for Project Apis M lives in California, and I live an hour and a quarter away from here, and uh, although I don't have any official function with the uh, Project Apis M, I know all of them, and I work with them and support them, and I do serve on a steering committee for one of their large projects, so I'm the stand-in, and I'm not anywhere near as good looking as Danielle is, but, uh, you, you know, I'm worth the price of admission anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this talk is actually not mine, although I worked it over and I was asked to give some extra uh, information about Varroa, uh, one of our most uh, difficult pests, and, uh, and also, something that I'm very in, interested in and active in is in, uh, in bee forage and, and, uh, and habitat uh, development for not only bees, but for other, uh, other animals. So, they're making motions <laughs> like we're getting close. And then we'll try to get this <coughs> so you can talk. I can just go ahead. Points, you know All what right. I mean? Okay. So set this here. So you go through your slides, and then what we'll do, guys, is we'll end up loading this online. I don't know. It was all up there and working right until we went to go live, and then I quit. But thanks for bearing with us. And yeah, George, you go off this until we can get set up. So George will just have the same talking points and everything. Just don't have the visual. Okay. okay so the title. Of the talk is <laughs> honeybees, the big picture, and it's how do honeybees fit in today's landscape, environment, economy, and lifestyle. So this isn't really maybe what some of you thought this would be about, you know, like basic beekeeping or something like that, although there is supposed to be a question and answer session at the end, so if you have any specific questions about that kind of thing, I'd be happy to talk about it. So today's presentation, I'm going to be talking about just some of the basic biological amazing things about bees, but reminding you that honeybees are not native to the Western Hemisphere. And um, also much of what we eat and use as citizens of this country is also not native. So if you think about apples, they, they didn't come from here. You think about beef, it didn't come from here. If you just go down and you do your homework sometime and you know your breakfast, how much of it actually originated from stuff that was here when people came here and started to take care of it? Not very much. We hear some cr criticism from time to time, oh, you know, native bees versus honeybees that aren't native. But come on, let's be fair. There's hardly anything that we're using and value that is native really. Some of it is, and there's a place for that um, in the landscape, but I think it's unrealistic to think that we're going to pollinate, for instance, crops that aren't native to here with native bees that have never seen that crop before and maybe don't match up very well. Certainly there aren't enough of them uh, in order to get the job done because of the way we grow things. So what honeybees do for us cannot be overstated. They're extremely valuable to us. 
but pollinators are struggling. And so are a lot of other animals struggling because of some of the decisions we're making and how we use our land. And I want to talk about that too in some detail. Now I don't even have my thing. <laughs> Where did it go? Did we lose it? A good speaker's supposed to be able to get through stuff like this, right? <laughs> so, um, so I'll just be starting out with uh, talking about some of the biology of the honeybee and boy, it helped me a lot. Yeah. All right. So I said pollinators are struggling, but it's not just pollinators, it's also um, a lot of other animals. Uh, songbirds, butterflies, when was the last time you saw a pheasant? Uh, there are all kinds of animals that are suffering and it's not because we're necessarily killing them, we're just not providing what they need. Project APSM is a non-profit organization which helps bees through um, funding, research programs, and forage programs. And then we'll talk a little bit of how, how you can help. I'm going the wrong way. So the biology, when I was a kid, I go out and catch bugs in a jar. When you catch one bee in a jar off of a flower, it is a meaningless animal because it cannot survive by itself over a long time period. Even if you caught a hundred of them off of a hundred different flowers, it still isn't a meaningful unit. It is in fact an organism which has many parts and it takes all of the parts in order for it to survive. So that we call it in a way a super organism because of all of those parts and it survives from one generation to another. So part of that has developed with the bee plant relationship, so that makes it even more of a superorganism because it isn't just an animal that has no meaning to anything else. It is very important to most plants, not all plants, but most plants. And over time and through success and failure, plants and bees have developed a different, uh, a special relationship and so they actually um, have signals between each other. They actually see things different than we, we do. They see different colors. They see different parts of the spectrum we can't see. And um, they have a compound eye which helps them when they're moving, but when they're sitting still, you can imagine it would be a whole bunch of dots and stuff. Um, but the bee doesn't really see things the way we do where we want a really crystal clear picture like a photograph or something like that. And we don't, they're, they're seeing things in a much uh, more fuzzy way and they're looking for different kinds of uh, signals as to what is there than we do. There's also a relationship between bees and flowers because of uh, an electric charge. Bees will actually pick up things off of flowers because they're opposite charge of what the flowers are. And then they'll carry them around and then they're there when they go to another flower and that's the way the pollen is actually, it's not just on the legs but it's all over their bodies so that um, they look kind of like this in, uh, with some plants it's uh, really obvious like uh, when the bees are working in uh, scotch broom, they'll just be covered in yellow. Other ones it's not, if you in it go into a blueberry field, you can hardly tell that the bees are getting any. In fact, a lot of people think the bees aren't doing any good in the blueberries because they don't seem to be, there's no pollen. And yet, if you look at them, you can see that there's pollen on their bodies. And in fact, it is being transferred. But it's a part, this electric uh, field is, uh, is a, an important part of that. And it's not just, um, you know, this developed over time it, because the plant needed the bees so much and success bred success and, 
and the things that didn't work have disappeared. So just a bunch of bees is a meaningless unit. They will die if they don't have the complete colony, all parts of it. Um, all animals have as their, if, we, if a human gives them words to their purpose, their purpose is to survive. And so for us, it's to replace ourselves by having children and so forth and so on. With, with the honeybee, um, it isn't just making another bee, it's making another colony that has meaning. And uh, that is um, done because they have this intricate interaction where the colony actually shares food, shares labor, and the individuals get the work done. But not all of them doing everything at the same time. They actually, when they first hatch out, they will have one job and then they'll graduate into another job and into another job and their final job is to collect nectar and pollen, bring them back to the hive. And uh, any time that a group of the bees that are, say, if you had a disaster of some sort and you lost all of the foragers, then the ones that aren't foragers yet will hurry up and become foragers to take their place. Or if you had a loss of all the nurse bees, because a bear came and wiped them all out, the older bees will actually go backwards in their body functions and will actually start doing the things that they thought they never had to do again. So the, bo the colony has all of these needs. They're divided up and everybody goes through all the stages, but um, the important thing is that the colony survives. Th when things happen where the colony dies, got in a fire, a bear ate it, teenagers poured gas on it or whatever, it has to be replaced. And so, well, how does that happen? It happens in naturally in nature with the swarm. And so we're talking about 60,000 bees, but they're not just all exactly the same. So in the hive, you're going to have a queen who will be laying the eggs. And in the hive, there will usually only be one. There can't, you'll probably, if you're around bees long enough, you'll see a hive where there are two. Uh, maybe the, the old one isn't laying any eggs anymore and she's wandering around the outside where she isn't going to ever meet the young one because when they do meet, they'll probably fight. But there's one and it's her job to lay eggs. And um, the workers do, are also females, but they are, are not able to lay, they, they can lay eggs, but they're not fertilized. And so they are unable to lay other workers. Then you have drones, the ones on the right, and they are males, and their only purpose, that's a drone, those are workers. Um, their only purpose is to mate with a queen, not with their queen, who is their mother. So, uh, but, so the queen, one per colony, she has mated right after emerging, she can lay fertilized eggs, all the sperm in her matings is in a spermatheca. She keeps them for life when she runs out. She can no longer lay fertilized eggs. The fertilized eggs are what become workers. Her abdomen is larger and she does have a stinger but it's not a barbed stinger. So she can sting if it got into a fight with a, uh, another queen, um, but it wouldn't um, cause her to die. Um, She's the mother of every bee in the colony, and she can lay as many as 2,000 eggs a day, and that's her only function. She is not a forager. She doesn't fight with, you know, yellow jackets or people when they, uh, when they threaten the colony. <coughs> so the drones, there may be 3,000 of them in there in the summertime, and their single function is to uh, is to mate with a queen. They fly out of the hive to a congregating area where unmated queens will be flying around and they mate in the air. Any drone that's lucky enough to mate will die, fall to the ground. Um, and, the, the, and she'll mate as many as 20 times uh, in, unless 
the weather doesn't allow her to do it or whatever. And uh, drones do not have a stinger at all. They cannot sting. Um, and when they're not needed in the fall, when the colony is no longer raising queens, um, they are usually evicted, just thrown out, and you'll see many of them dying, dead or dying, in front of the hive in the fall when the weather takes a, a turn to the cooler. So the workers are the vast majority of the hive. They're all female. Uh, they do all of the tasks in succession, uh, except they have never mated, and um, they, under normal circumstances, they won't lay eggs. Now, they have all of the reproductive organs in them, so they, in the absence of a queen, some of them might try to lay eggs, but since they're not fertile, they would be not become workers, which is, would cause the colony to slowly dwindle and die because it wouldn't have enough workers to do the work to keep the colony going. Um, honeybee stinger has a barb on it, and so when they sting it and they try to get away, it pulls their innards out and, and they'll die. So it's a pretty uh, expensive defense for the colony to, uh, to so they, they, they will sting when provoked, but um, it's not a particularly uh, useful defense if all of the bees stung everybody and, and they all died and the colony wouldn't, you know. So at any rate, it's an expensive defense. So the development of the colony uh, is uh, th the egg um, up there is laid by the queen in the bottom of the cell. It develops into a larvae, next stage, which then gets capped over and the larvae will stretch out and will metamorphize into a pupae. And late in that cycle, it will, it's no longer being fed. It was fed everything while the cell was open. When it's closed, everything is going on. It's been fed everything it's going to get. And then late in it, it's, it starts getting its eyes developed, getting color. And then its hair and wings are the, some of the last things to develop. And then it will chew its way out and crawl out as an adult and immediately become a nurse bee, feeding other larvae and cleaning the cells for the next use. So that takes 21 days for a worker. <coughs> so individual bees contribute to the, all the needs of the hive and the functions of the hive, and no one group of bees could do it all. But the swarming or the fission of the colony, the splitting of the colony, is how it replaces those that naturally get sick or die or are destroyed. And so in nature, um, colonies will normally swarm once per year. If every colony that's survived and its swarm survived, you know, the first year you'd have one, next year you'd have two, next year you'd have four, and pretty soon we would be this deep in bees and uh, there wouldn't be uh, anything working anymore. In, fa in fact, all other things being equal, in nature, even though one becomes two, two becomes four, it stays the same. In other words, they have about a 50% success rate just enough to keep things going. In good years, you'll have more hives in nature, and in bad years, you'll have fewer, but in, over time, you have that success. Now, you want to have better than 50% success, and so that means you're going to have to take care of some of those things that might, like diseases and pests and teenagers and, you know, bears, uh, in order to make sure that you aren't replacing your colony every other year. So um, now that was what it was before we had the Varroa mite. And I'll talk about the Varroa mite a little bit later. Um, so they are specialists. They have a nest. It's very clearly defined. The cells are always the same size and the same depth and, 
and uh, they are very picky about their home and so forth, and the hive that we provide them is very close to what they would look for in nature, and uh, it's, uh, and all of its spacings and all of that are very closely related to what bees would do for themselves in, in a natural s setting. So you have these specialist bees that, um, this isn't my word, learn special tasks. I, it seems like they, it's not, there's no one teaching them. They just know what to do and they move on when it's time to do the next thing and so forth and they know how to do all of it, it seems like. Um, and this, there is uh, an efficiency with, by dividing this labor. So everybody has to, doesn't have to do everything. However, it's just kind of comical if you've ever seen slow motion pictures of bees doing things. It sure looks like there are a lot of bees that are just doing nothing. <laughs> and so I don't know how much efficiency is involved, but um, <coughs> you know, when you have 60,000 and you know, something gets done anyway. <laughs> uh, and they communicate with each other. And this is one of the most valuable parts of their survival. So. Um, there's a slide about this. They also have to thermoregulate. So this, the egg in the center of the cluster has, will only grow and hatch at a particular temperature, very close within a couple of, of tenths of a, of a degree. And so no matter what the outside temperature is, when the, the brood has to be kept at that temperature. If it gets too hot, they have to cool it off by bringing in water and fanning. And when it gets really cold, they cluster up and they have to maintain that temperature. Um, so the dance language, let's see where this slide is. So it is in fact the most complex language ciphered by humans and it involves um, foragers that have gone out and have found something or nothing will come back to the hive and on the, se on the, on the frame, the vertical frame, they will do this little dance uh, and it is basically a figure eight, sorry, a figure eight and in the middle of the eight they will waggle and the length of that waggle and the number of waggles per second will indicate how good the source or bad the source was. The angle from vertical is indicates the angle from the sun that they found this thing at. <coughs> and there's also another part of it that will tell them how far they have to go within a, a few yards. So they're constantly <coughs> doing this. And the other half of it is that some bees are always looking not for the thing that's obviously the best, but the thing that's over the hill that maybe nobody knows about. So that if in fact they lose the thing that's the best, they have a backup plan. They know about stuff that's on there. So there's a percentage of the bees that are always doing something different than the very best thing. And there, that's true of nectar and pollen sources as well. Um, they will always, bees know for pollen, they know that they need different sources of protein in order to have a complete diet. So that if everybody went to the one that's closest best, they'd only have one kind of protein. But they need a diverse diet. So even in the, in the uh, just the, the vastness of a huge nectar flow very close to the hive, there will be a percentage of bees that are looking for something that isn't obvious. And that has served them very well over time. So the thermoregulation, this just kind of shows you uh, that, that the temperature at the center is always going to be the same no matter what the ambient temperature is. And they do that through either clustering and eating honey, creating heat, or by dispersing, fanning, getting water, and kind of making mini swamp coolers in the hive, actually blowing air across uh, water that's hanging on, on uh, the sides in order to cool the hive off. Um, Beeswax, which is their whole house is made out of, melts at a temperature just uh, about 110 degrees. 
So if they get the temperature getting out of control, which could easily happen with each one of these bees is creating a little bit of heat, and if they're not able to regulate that, it, it, you know, on a hot day, you could get to 100 degrees and everything would run out the entrance. So they obviously have to do this. Um, same thing on a cold night, uh, trying to protect brood. So products of the hive. So you have honey, pollen, propolis, beeswax, royal jelly. Queen bees themselves are a saleable item and bee venom. Um, honey and pollen, I think, are probably unnecessary to talk about. Propolis is actually uh, collected plant resins, saps, often from poplars, um, but it's used to glue things together. But it also has antimicrobial um, benefits to the hive, and they kind of coat the whole inside of their hive, and it, it is one of the immune responses or defenses that they have uh, to envelop their whole hive in an antimicrobial envelope. It's kind of gooey stuff and you can buy tincture of propolis and stuff for human consumption too. Some people swear by it. Um, so the pro propolis is used even as, as a curtain sometimes to, you know, if their entrance is too big, They'll, they'll make it smaller. This is, for a beekeeper, this is kind of a nuisance because it's just gooey stuff and it is in the way of everything, but it really has a function and uh, some hives collect and use a lot more than others. Um, so beeswax is actually, um, when, when bees of a certain age, like in their adolescence or something, uh, eat a lot of honey, it actually, they have some glands in their body and it secretes these flakes of beeswax, which then they will grab and chew and make into their, into their comb. It takes honey to make wax. And so um, at times of the year when they need to repair a comb or build a comb or something like that, but there's no honey coming in or they're not being fed, they'll borrow wax from places where they don't need it and uh, it will, you know, it'll be darker and and, and you can tell right away, but the, the very clean wax that they make um, as in the middle of a honey flow is, is very, very light, almost white. And so it has lots of uses, candles, as a, one of the first sources of candles, for candles in human history. Um, it also has been valued in, for a long time in civilization, um, uh, seven or eight hundred years before Christ, um, beeswax was used as a painting medium. Um, and we still have examples of it that were dug up in tombs in um, Byzantium. And they would uh, heat the wax and pigment it and put it down. And during the life of, the per of an individual, they would paint a picture of them and then when they were mummified, they would put the, pa the painting on the, uh, on the mummy. And these, of course, would be underground and they were protected. And we have examples in museums now that uh, still exist. Boat building, it was one of the first sealants for wooden boats, uh, wood finishing, cosmetics. Um, honey, obviously, lots of different kinds of honey. And uh, if you take the 2.7 but or 2.5 million colonies of bees and you have 178 million pounds of honey and you multiply it even by $10 a pound, that's the value of our honey crop. Uh, in the United States, Canada it has a larger per colony amount, but at any rate, most of that honey is sent to the United States and is sold here. Um, an individual bee produces just a drop, a small drop. Of, of honey, so in order to get a, a crop of, uh, you know, for 50 or 60 or 100 pounds in a colony, you can imagine how many bees had to be involved in that. In pollen, um, they collect it and you can collect it yourself. It, um, it's a special crop, it has some, some uses, but collecting it is, uh, is a little tricky in our humid conditions. Uh, you have to collect it often and freeze it immediately because it has a tendency to want to ferment or spoil. 
But what is the most valuable thing we get from bees? It's even if you multiply all those things by some ridiculous prices that you see on the shelves these days, it doesn't come close to the value of what bees do in pollination per year in the United States or Canada, either one. And there are many crops that are absolutely and totally dependent on honeybees. Um, part of it is a great deal that has to do with what, um, the way we grow them. We grow so many acres of the same thing in one place uh, that uh, other pollinators are just, there's nobody taking care of them, there's nobody bringing them and taking them away, and they're susceptible to all kinds of spraying and uh, in a way that honeybees are also susceptible, but honeybees, so somebody taking care of them and will move them out of harm's way when they need to. So, uh, and when they die, then a beekeeper will usually try to replace them somehow. So, we have all those things that are totally dependent on, um, on honeybees. It's some of the most interesting food that we eat. And some of them heavily rely on honeybees. And uh, taking, for instance, uh, blackberries or, or raspberries, um, you will get a berry if it isn't visited by a, the flower's not visited by a bee, but it will probably be a smaller berry and it will weigh a lot less so that the pollination from a commercial standpoint is very important in creating a heavy and large crop. So all of these things and going together, you see some uh, pretty important crops up there, soybeans, which are definitely, we now know are improved, their crops are improved and enhanced by the presence of honeybees, even though the growers don't ever bring bees in uh, <coughs> to uh, pollinate them. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> For a variety of reasons, beekeepers um, move their bees, uh, not just short distances, but long distances in order to meet the need and the largest demand for bees for pollination in the United States is for almonds in California. California produces the majority of the almonds for the world and, um, and there are not anywhere near enough bees in the state of California to pollinate that crop. So bees are brought in from everywhere to do this on big trucks and put into the orchards. Um, but there are also crops in other parts of, uh, you know, Pacific Northwest, our little place, and you go into the upper Midwest, and they have canola, and, and uh, you have citrus, and blueberries, and um, lo lots of other crops, cranberries. Um, those are all dependent upon honeybees, and bees are brought in to <coughs> pollinate those crops from wherever it, is, it makes sense. So this is kind of what it looks like putting all those bees onto a truck and, and uh, putting a net over them and sending them across the country. And um, in some cases, the rent can be as much as $200 a colony. In reality, we get paid that for almond pollination and we get paid uh, something not quite that much for some, uh, some specialty crops, but most of the time it's well under $100. Um, but still, um, and it's hard on the bees. So it's not a th free thing. Um, when we take our, when I take my bees to the almonds, we feed them five gallons of sugar syrup while they're there. So uh, that's, it, they're not making anything for me except money. And it takes money in order to keep them in good condition so that they will be ready not only for the almond grower, but then for the blueberry or pear or apple grower that gets them next. And then for the seed grower that gets them next. And, um, we can't just let them run into the ground. So uh, that $23 billion of pollination is uh, basically one of three bites, one in three bites of food that we eat in our country. I'm going the wrong way again. And there's uh, uh, just a footnote on almonds. And um, so we're putting bees in almonds in, uh, on the 1st of February, which is 
technically the middle of winter. And that's the time of the year when bees would want to be hibernating, clustered up, saving resources. But instead, we are pushing and pushing and pushing to try and get them ready to, uh, to do the almonds at a time of the year when the natural cycle for the bees is uh, absolutely the opposite. And we're also finding a lot of mother nature with flooding and, um, and bad weather, taking bees over the mountain passes and the snow and storms and, and all of that. Um, so I've been in all of those places. That's, none of them are me, but I've, I recognize those things. And I recognize this too. Um, sometimes it's just unreal what, we're, what we have to do in order to get the job done in time. So bees are in trouble and there's been a lot in the news and some people have said, well, it's the cell phones or it's ra the rapture, it's terrorist uh, conspiracy or the Russians or something. Um, that's not what the problem is. We, the, um, the bees are facing a lot of stresses and the varroa mite, which I'll talk about here pretty quick, um, is the number one enemy of bees. We have other pathogens that are also related or um, when the colony is weakened by one thing, it will allow another thing to uh, thrive. And so viruses um, and some parasites and bacterial and fungus diseases are very serious for bees. And I must say that part of the problem is that we keep so many bees so close to each other that it, the contagious things are likely to occur. Um, if we just had one bee here and another, you know, another colony a mile and a half down there and so forth and so on, they would be insulated from some of this stuff, but we keep 50 or 100 in one place or a truckload or whatever. And so if something starts over here, it, it can go through the whole outfit very quickly in much the way, same way that chicken and swine and cattle have problems when you keep them in stock pot, stockyards. <coughs> Pesticides are a problem and uh, some of them, beekeepers uh, apply them in order to control some of those diseases and pathogens, but a lot of it's in the environmental um, and farmers are applying them in order to control their pests. And then there are environmental stresses, nutrition, we'll talk a little bit about it, and habitat and forage loss um, due to um, land use decisions. So Project Apis M was actually started originally uh, by the almond industry in order to support the honeybee industry because the almond industry is so dependent on honeybees. And so it came from there, but it's grown to a much larger organization and it's not at all dependent upon the almond industry any longer. So all of this stuff, they've invested millions of dollars in <coughs> research and uh, they have funded over a hundred research projects um, with money which has been donated or which they have been uh, given to, uh, to manage to get the best uh, uh, use out of it, both practical <laughs> applied research and other uh, practical management questions have been researched. Um, always looking for innovation and they also um, through uh, mo money mostly from Costco, they uh, support scholars and uh, they fund several um, uh, professors doing honeybee research in the United States at a couple of universities and in Canada as well. So one of the things that it becomes uh, important when you face these kinds of issues is that if you're dealing with small amounts of money that aren't guaranteed from one year to the next, then you can only fund very small short term kinds of projects, which limits the kinds of things you can look at and the kinds of problems you can solve. But since um, Project Apis M has a, a, a good source and a long standing source of uh, funding, it's able to do long term and larger scale projects. But the funding has to come from somewhere. So now I want to talk a little bit about Varroa. Varroa destructor, it's, um, it says it's a parasite, but it's really a pest. A parasite ha 
host relationship is one where a parasite will use the host in order to survive, but it won't kill the host because if the host dies, then it dies. This parasite jumped off of uh, a, a, a cousin of the honeybee in Asia. And when honeybees were introduced into Asia, it found just enough success on the honeybee, but the honeybee has no natural defense. It doesn't know what it is. And so it is killed eventually by the varroa. So it makes a hole and feeds on the bee, and there's some discussion of whether they're feeding on fat bodies or whether they're feeding on blood. It doesn't really matter. It actually vectors viruses. They're carrying viruses, and when it punctures the, the body of the, uh, of the bee, it actually injects viruses into the bee. And um, so viruses that were ubiquitous in the air before Varroa, but didn't ever get a toehold because they couldn't get inside. Now, the Varroa is opening it all up, and all this stuff is becoming a major problem. Um, so it'll weaken and eventually will kill the, the colony. And it is an introduced species. Um, so if, if you were a bee and you had a Varroa on you, it would be <coughs> that big. That's what the bee is having to deal with. And they could have many of them on them. And they don't know what to do. They, you know, they try and kick them off, they try and wiggle, and they try and, you know, chew on them and stuff like that, but nothing that they know to do really helps. The Varroa does most of its damage in, on the pupal stage, inside of the brood. And that's um, a place where the bees can't get at, even. And the only time they're on outside of, on the uh, bees that are walking around or is when it has emerged on an adult bee and it hasn't found another one to sell the one to go into. So, but most of the damage is done just as that picture shows. So the natural host to the, for varroa mite is the Aphis serrana, the cousin of the honeybee is out of the, in Asia. And it does have a natural defense for that parasite. So it is a host parasite relationship with Apis serrana. But Apis mellifera has been introduced all over the world. It's a good animal. It helps us. And so well-intentioned people have taken it all over the world. And it has been moved around unintentionally as well. So um, one of the obvious ones, uh, not only Africanized bees, but also bees carrying varroa mites have been moved all over the world in pipe rigging, which has moved around the world depending on where they're drilling for oil. And, um, but that's just one way. Shipping containers and, and certainly, I mean, uh, well-intentioned missionaries took Apis mellifera to Asia because they thought it was a better bee. Had no idea that they were creating a monster by getting it too close to Apis serrana. So there are some intentional introductions as well where people have just either smuggled them or just or done it because they they were trying to do the right thing to help so uh, um, anyway that's I've already said most of this it's uh, everywhere in the world except Australia and it has no natural defenses against Varroa uh, there is no host parasite relationship I said that and control is achieved through a combination of management and chemical controls. There are some people who believe, and they've been told, that, that the bees, if you take care of them and keep them well fed, and if you love them a lot, that they'll be okay. But the truth of it is that you have to do something to control Varroa. Something active, not just something, leave them alone. And it isn't just a victimless crime to have your hive die from Varroa because just before the hive dies, the bees become so discouraged, they pick up and they leave and abandon the colony and any other colonies within miles of your dying colony or my dying colony, those bees will fly and try and find another colony to go into and guess what they're carrying on their backs? They're bringing Varroa with them. So a very common 
new thing that we didn't think we had to worry about was that someone who has very good control methods for Varroa and is actually seeing their Varroa levels at a level where they want them, a month later we'll see that their levels are like this again. And it didn't happen internally through the natural growth of the, it happened because they had a huge invasion of bees coming from swarms that are dying, nobody's taking care of them, or colonies that aren't being taken care of and they're dying. So we're having to just watch all the time and not just treat once successfully, we have to treat and then test and make sure we aren't getting this reinvasion and then treat again and so, so forth. So um, management and chemical controls. Some of those controls, chemical controls might be considered organic or you know, with an organic acid or something like that. So it isn't always just some nasty, nasty petrochemical. So the mite, the way they work, is uh, the adult female will come down and will, in the open larvae, just before it's going to be capped over, and will start laying eggs, and uh, th her eggs will hatch, and one of them is a male, and she will mate with that male, which is actually she's related to. And um, she, there's just enough time for one and a, just over one mite per adult to um, to actually succeed. And the the original foundress also will live to go into another cell. So at first, the growth in population of the row is fairly slow because it's just like one on top of the one that's already there, and so forth. And uh, eventually, uh, it gets to a tipping point where there's just um, all the brood is being damaged or dying. And, there's, uh, and that would happen late summer, usually. So that's the kind of the biology of, the, of that. So at any one time, um, 75 or 80 percent of the mites in the summertime are actually in the brood under caps so that treatments that we use have no effect on them. We're only able to get the mites which are on the outside of the phoretic bees, the ones that are you know, out, out and wandering around, the phoretic mites. The ones that are, the majority of them are in here. And so if you kill all of these ones for another 15 or you know, two weeks or so, as this brood hatches out, you get mites again and again and again. Uh, so it's a long process. Um, so there are some organic acids that are effective. Uh, uh, oxalic acid and formic acid are commonly used, but they only kill the phoretic mites, the ones that are on the backs of the bees, and so um, you would have to do repeated uh, treatments. And this stuff, at first the bees tolerate it, but after you know, two or three or four treatments, it starts really having an effect on the bees as well. Um, so the miticides with long-acting formulas uh, sometimes have serious effects on bees as well. Um, you know, the, the pet petrochemical ones, and some, some of the problems have been reduced sperm count and egg-laying ability of of queens and, and other things like that. So we're really stuck between a hard, hard place and a rock uh, on a lot of this stuff. But if you don't do some kind of treatment, your bees will die. <coughs> Takes about a year. So Project A is M has uh, a bunch of, you can read through these, uh, some of these uh, projects that they have funded in order to uh, tackle this particular problem. Some of them have to do with breeding some of them have to do with uh, um, other ways of uh, trying to figure out what management will work. Uh, there was a feeling at one point that if you interrupted the brood cycle with a hive swarming or going queenless or whatever, that this would be uh, a help. And it is a help, but it isn't enough to get you all the way there. So for a while, people were going around saying, well, if my hive swarmed, I don't have to worry about mite problems because I 
it was interruption in the brood cycle. And it, it just isn't really true at all. Um, and here's some more. They've looked at a lot of stuff and try to find if there's a natural pest that would take care of the varroa mite, if there's a, uh, a DNA trigger that you could turn off something so that they wouldn't succeed, or if, if you had a colony could be raised that would have, instead of a 21-day brood cycle, would have a 20-day brood cycle by using a smaller cell, which everything would go faster. Um, they've tried all of these kinds of things, and it, every, the best you can say is, well, maybe, <laughs> but nothing, nothing yet. So nutrition, um, oh, these are some other projects. I, you know, I have to apologize. These, I've never given this talk before, so I, I'm, you know, I've, I've looked through it a bunch of times, but I, I'm not really uh, up to speed on some of these slides. One of the most pr promising uh, things that has helped uh, has been this tech transfer team. It's um, it's a group of, uh, of uh, college students, basically, uh, or you know, people that graduated from college, and they've been hired by this Be Informed partnership to go around and provide uh, a analytic data for beekeepers. And we pay for it, it's subsidized by other people. They come and they take samples at key times of the year to find out what our uh, mite levels are, what our nosema levels are. It's a uh, pests that we have, and to provide other things, including uh, in if we have a pesticide kill or something like that, they'll come and take the samples and, and send them in, have them analyzed. Um, it it's basically for commercial beekeepers, but now they're setting it up. If you look up Bee Informed Partnership, you can see that they do provide kits so that if you want to take samples yourself. You can learn how to do it and send it back to the lab at the University of Maryland, and they'll tell you what your levels are. Uh, I'm probably pointing at the wrong thing. Which computer? Silly. I actually, I think the battery might be dead because the, the red thing doesn't show anymore either. Okay. All right, I'll just do it manually. Because I think that right. the battery on this. I, I, I can't get it to work, yeah. anything. So um, talking about forage a little bit, bees travel, uh, will, can travel three to five miles. And if you look at that area, that is an area of between 28 and 70 miles, square miles. And so um, you'd think that they'd be able to find something in all of that. But um, we're finding that uh, with pesticides, of course, you know, traveling that far, they're they're vulnerable to pesticides over all of that area. And so it isn't just a matter of what you can see or what you know about. And a lot of people have thought that the, uh, that the honeybee is like the uh, canary in the coal mine, that um, th th if when, the, when the bird died, then the miners knew they needed to get out of the mine uh, because it wasn't safe. Uh, pesticide samples in that have been taken will very often show a hum just a, a horrendous number of residues, uh, commonly 121, uh, 120 uh, different pesticides in collected pollen that are stored in the hive that are the bees' food. Um, all of those are not obviously in uh, acute levels where they're going to actually kill anything, but they all are interacting with each other and they're not exactly clean, uh, so it's not good. So 
uh, and there are new ones ha being used all the time. Some of them are systemics uh, and the neonicotinoids that are famous. Um, so now we used, to, we used to just be interested in what, uh, what would kill adult bees in what percentage, and now we're having to look at sublethal things where the da root is damaged uh, uh, but maybe not killed. And the EPA really honestly is not up to speed on all of this stuff. They're still uh, struggling trying to upgrade their, their risk assessment. But projects to, to try and find out what is actually going on are funded by Project Avisem. So uh, the acute bee poisonings are not as common as they used to be, thank goodness, but there's more and more chronic poisoning. And the, this is what's actually, besides the, you know, the varroa, but um, the bees are just slowly dwindling because they're not getting what they need and the stresses and, and other issues are just taking them down. Um, bees do have immune systems and they are able to handle toxic materials um, and mitigate them in their bodies, but if they get a herbicide or a fungicide that is, and their immune system is dealing with that to keep them from getting sick, and then there's another chemical that comes in. Well, their immune system is all busy now. It's used up. And so things that normally wouldn't hurt them might hurt them because there's so many things that are, they're being presented with. So how do we mitigate this stress? And it's mostly, um, it's indirect and that's through nutrition and habit and forage, forage uh, situations. Um, I feel like I'm uh, spending too much time. How am I doing for time? You're doing good. Your exercise is over. It's sufficient. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, it'll help. Um, so uh, this is uh, kind of where I'm coming from, that our bees are living in a diminished <laughs> landscape. And so what do I mean by a diminished landscape? Well, if you had a beautiful meadow with flowers and stuff and you had a fire come through, like, what happens from time to time. Obviously that landscape wouldn't be of much use to bees for a while, but that's really not what I'm talking about. We have natural disasters, hurricanes and fires and other weird things that'll happen, floods that will take uh, landscape out of a uh, forage situation. Um, but that's temporary. That's not really what I'm talking about. Um, what I'm talking about is when we decide to manage a landscape, we make it into a garden, we make it into a park, we make it into a parking lot, we make it into um, a housing development, we make it into a cornfield, we make it into a highway or whatever. Whenever we make those decisions, uh, we're, we're deciding, well, how are we best gonna use the land? And my point is that when we do that, even though it may be for a good reason and have a good outcome, we almost never think about what was there before and what might have gotten some value from that land before. It might have been abandoned, might have been not making anybody any money, but when we do something like this in a field, in a meadow or whatever, now, yeah, we're creating electricity, but what is there for bees and birds and other, other animals? And, uh, um, and when we make these decisions, I'm gonna guarantee you that almost nobody is thinking about those things. When it's just a field here and a field there, well, probably isn't very important. But the way that our land is being utilized so quickly and so extensively now, it's changing very quickly. And sometimes you drive down the road and you can see it happening from one week to the next. Other times you think, well, it's fine, you know, we still have lots of stuff out there. But um, we're getting so good at controlling competition and pests, we're just really good at it. And now what used to not be a really big deal, we'd have the fence lines still with weeds and we'd have the roadsides that would have stuff. And now those are all clean. Everybody wants them clean. They don't want anything there. And you know, when I got started in beekeeping, my mentor, told me, you know, when he was in the 50s, before you had herbicides, it didn't matter what you grew in the Willamette Valley, there'd be crimson clover and hairy vetch coming up because there were no herbicides. And so you just hope that your corn gets up above it. <laughs> and now, unless that's what you're growing, you don't have any of that. 
and the roadsides aren't, don't have it, and it's just it's not there anymore. So things have really become diminished in terms of their value to bees and other. Then the other thing to think about is here we have in Oregon, I just made a list, it changes almost every year a little bit, but not that much. These are our most largest uh, ag crops by dollar value and stuff. But you look through that, how many of them have any value for honeybees at all? Well, you can see it in there, maybe pears, they bloom, but as soon as they're done blooming, now what is there for bees? There's nothing. And so even though almonds are a tremendous source of uh, value to bees in the spring, the whole rest of the year that is an absolute desert. Those orchards have no place, nothing for bees to be there. And how many of these crops actually go out of their way to make sure that there is nothing there for bees? And these are our largest crops. Right now we're going through a period where we're planting a lot of hazelnuts. And uh, you know, you just have to wonder, uh, th this is gonna be like this, a zero for bees and other animals for decades. And if we put in you know, the million acres, we won't, but if we did, uh, like they did almonds in California, I mean, this takes up a lot of the landscape. And what did it replace? And what are the bees and the butterflies and the birds supposed to do around all of this? Has anybody thought about it or do they feel badly about it at all? So these monocrops, they don't support bees after bloom. If they ever bloom, uh, land is being converted for urbanization. The largest impact on bee forage in the United States was made in, by a decision that was made to incentivize growing corn and soybeans in the United States, partly because of fuel. And when that happened, millions of acres of prairie land was put under the plow and then was incentivized to get water onto it and then they were insurance programs to make sure that farmers would make money doing it and so forth and so on had a huge impact, not so much in Oregon, but in the Midwest where most bees are in the summer uh, in our country, it had a huge di uh, impact, to negative. So Project APISM is involved in a, in a project, uh, a couple of them, one of them in, in California to try and create some forage around and in almond orchards uh, after bloom and before bloom and a much larger project in North Dakota and actually the upper Midwest, there are five or seven states that they're involved with. And it is not just for honeybees, but also for monarch butterflies. And uh, a large percentage of all the bees in the United States spend their summer in that area because it's relatively undeveloped, uh, has been until um, corn and soybeans and uh, oil became a big part of the economy. So they do a lot at with seed mixes and uh, for cover crops and almonds and then uh, trying to work with growers to make sure they have, uh, it, it makes sense for them to do, to do this. Um, seeds for bees and then the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. So I already talked about after the bloom, this becomes an absolute desert for bees and a dangerous place even that because that's when they start using their pesticides. They're good about it uh, while we're in there but as soon as uh, they don't need us, um, yeah, they're trying to kill their pests. So Seeds for Bees does this kind of a thing, try and get something going in the center. Water's a big issue in California though. And so anyway, um, I'm gonna jump through this pretty quickly. The Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund um, is a, it's a non-government funded uh, program and at one point they called them the Next Gen Habitat Fund and Next Generation because they were not depending on native plants and seeds that were expensive and were difficult to grow but rather using non-invasive plants which were important to the bees and butterflies and growing them in such a way that farmers could get a subsidy to make sure they weren't losing money. Um, so that's the part of the country. Um, it was converted in out of uh, uh, 
wetlands, grasslands, and shrub grew to all crops by county at that time when that decision was made. And that's why the Middle West is, Midwest is where they're doing most of their work. And so many things depend on the, the, that land there. Um, so this is a piece of land, I think it's in Nebraska actually, and uh, this is what it looked like before in June of 2012, and uh, the farmer using subsidies put it under the plow and was subsidized to put uh, irrigation water on it, and this will never make a crop, never, never did, and yet he was paid to grow it because he had crop insurance. But look at the devastation to the landscape. So this is a decision which had um, big impact. Uh, and it was, you know, it was short sighted in so many aspects, even though perhaps the initial decision was at, had a target which was laudable, but not, not the outcome. So almost every farm has some place on it where it doesn't, the crop doesn't do very well. This is a, you know, the, the rows to the outside and where they get shade and or don't get the right amount of water or whatever. And if you harvested the corn from those rows that we were just looking at, you'll see that the ones on the side of the field don't do very well. And the farmer doesn't even make any money doing it, and yet they keep on planting it. So an area like that might be a really good place to do some forage projects. And um, they're not making any money on it already, already, so if you can convince them of that, then this is an area where we might have some impact. Um, so some real world, ex world examples. Um, so you know, there's so much technology now telling farmers where they're making their best crops, and, and they, they actually can tell their machinery where to plant and where to fertilize and how much water to put in different places and stuff. And there's some places that they, they know from their own information that they're not making any money on. And so the Conservation Reserve Program perhaps could go into some of those areas and that uh, with the right seed mixes that could do a, a lot of good. Um, so this is just an example of what happens um, with actual production on some 2013 numbers and CRP, Conservation Reserve Program, um, same thing, and you see at the bottom, they actually make more money, uh, field profit, by putting it into forage than they would if they tried to farm it. So, uh, so you can see that there's an increase in almost every area. So who funds PAM? Beekeepers, growers of pollinated crops, grants, corporate sponsors, and you can too. Um, there is a button on the web page where if you want to uh, support it, you can press the button and tell them that you'll give them $5 or 10 or whatever it is and it will make a difference. As well as the kinds of project that Coastal is doing. Um, th these things are really important. So I think that's it. And you wanted to finish that up? Well, I think we're gonna do, you wanna do some question and answers? Real fast. So we're gonna do some question and answers and take some of that and then we'll go to the, in case the live feed um, runs out on us. And uh, and then I'll come back and talk about backing. I think I just turned off the program. And, and, and that's fine. It, they can see <laughs> that and talk about it. But do you guys have any questions for George? Back. Mm -hmm. If I'd given you any actual solutions to the problems, then okay, but <laughs> uh, I pointed out some problems, but I think that, uh, I was just talking to a friend of mine, I, I hope this isn't offensive to anybody, but he, he just said, well, when you talk to people like this, you have to tell them beekeeping is not for sissies. It's, 
It's serious stuff. And bad stuff happens. And uh, when it does, you just have to pick up the pieces and learn from the experience and start over again and try and be smarter the next time. Okay, so um, th there's a website that uh, I'll tell you about. It's on the Honey Bee Health Coalition website, and there's a Varroa guide in the menu, and you would look at that, and it has all, it's only talking about registered materials. So when anything that's not registered is not talked about there. Um, and there are some, in fact, the majority of the materials are not petrochemical. They're, they're acids and <coughs> thymol and materials like that. And so you pick your poison. You go in and you say, well, this is what I have that I want to try and do, and these are the materials that are available to me. And it says when and where, but you need to learn to recognize your mite levels. So there's a section in on that web page that will help you to learn how to monitor your levels. Normally we do a, a two treatments in the year, two time periods, once in the spring, and then we stop treating in the midsummer when the honey is on the hive. There are a very limited number of materials which can be used when honey is on the hive. Uh, I'm not gonna get into details, but that website will tell you which ones can be. And there are ones which have very short-term efficacy, so uh, it would be just a, a quick blast and maybe a very temporary dip uh, to try and buy yourself some time. And then once your honey comes off in the late summer, then you, uh, you have a, a, that's when the mite levels are the highest and the most likely damage. And so that, uh, for sure, you have to have some uh, efficacy. And uh, I'll say it again, you have to learn how to monitor your levels to make sure that even if you did the right thing and you did a good job, you check later to make sure that you're still in good shape because you may have to retreat. Is that? We have a question online here. <laughs> um, what is the effect of hornet and bee mycelium toxin in honey colds and the effect on the pollen and egg cups? Hornets. Uh, I'm assuming they're probably, well, there are fewer problems with hornets than there are with wasps. Okay, so, but that's not really pertinent to the question. So, uh, yellow jackets are the most common thing that people notice around honeybees, and especially in the fall. Um, yellow jackets will hang around the entrance and in the morning when the bees are really lethargic because it's cold and stuff, they'll pick off a couple. Um, and so they, they kind of do a scavenging job if the colony is very strong, the yellow jackets will not get a chance to get a good start and will, will just be repulsed at the entrance over and over again. In the summertime, uh, it's not an issue. Yellow jackets start out with very small populations and it is until the late summer when their populations get large and they can have an impact. They really won't kill a hive unless the hive is in deep trouble already. But a lot of beekeepers will say, oh, the yellow jackets killed my hive. But chances are the hive was so weak it couldn't defend itself anyway. Beekeepers will often reduce their entrances in, as soon as the honey comes off so that they have a smaller opening to protect from yellow jackets. And they'll, so it won't be a problem. But uh, boy, if you have a way of getting rid of all the yellow jackets in the neighborhood way, you, know, you could make a lot of money. Coastal would probably buy the product. Yeah, they, um, they're, on, they're on bees, so when you buy a package or you buy a nucleus hive or you catch a swarm, almost for sure there is a mite in there already that avoided uh, whatever, you know, wherever it came from. But uh, bees actually, um, 
Sometimes they, well, drones, for instance, don't ha they don't just stay in their own hive. They'll go around. They can carry mice on their backs from hive to hive. And there's something going on, too, because the, the mice have a tendency to find hives that are where they have success. And, and so they must be moving around. Um, they, they don't have wings, so they can't, and they, they can't really crawl from hive to hive or anything. It has to be on the bees. Okay. So is there a, like, certain time of the year that you notice more, more of those uh, pests come in kind of in the season? Yeah, the fall is the time when, when most of the problems occur. You have mites all year long, but, um, but in the fall is when they have, see, in the fall, the queen will, will lay less brood and the drones are all kicked out and the varroa likes the drones because they take longer to hatch and so they have more success. So the as long as drones are being raised, then the mites stick on the drones. But in the fall, when the drones are kicked out, then all those mites are start attacking the worker brood and that's when the colony just really takes it, uh, a dive because the, they need all those workers. So the fall time is the, the time when you notice it the most, but you know, if you start with one mite, one percent phoretic mice in, in April, every month they will double. So go to two percent, three percent is the threshold on phoretic mice. That means there's more than that because there's a lot of brood in the hive as well. Three percent is the threshold. At that point you start seeing virus problems and stuff like that. The next year, next month it's six percent. And then it's 12 percent. So by the time you get to August, you could be at 15 or 18 percent. The colony's just dead, but it doesn't know it. So I guess my question was, uh, I guess by using that time frame, like the same time like the diatomaceous earth, or uh, they they, they haven't used diatomaceous earth to my knowledge. Uh, but what they have used, they found that if you uh, dust the colony with powdered sugar, all the bees, and just get them all covered with, and then shake them in a sieve that um, it actually causes the mites to lose their hold. The phoretic mites, remember, you still have all the mites in the brood. And then if you do it in a sieve and throw away the, the uh, powdered sugar, that it, it will reduce your level. It's, it's, in the, it's in the, they'll talk about it, but it is, um, you have to do it over and over and over again to catch all the mites that are emerging in, in the brood. Dive, I can't, I can't, I don't know anything about whether diatomaceous earth has been tried. I don't know. So, uh, first of all, their brood cycle is different, but, uh, than ours, but, the Apis mellifera. But what basically they do is they have a grooming behavior where they groom them off of each other. And the other thing is they recognize, they somehow know in the cell with the capped cell with the pupae when there is a mite in there. And they actually open it up and take out the, the, uh, the pupae, mite and all, and throw it out. <laughs> and, and so they do that and that reduces dramatically the number of mites that are in there. Of course, it also hampers their growth, but uh, you know. So th there's been, uh, answering her question still, there have been some attempts to um, breed bees that have what are called super hygienic behavior. And you can look all this stuff up and find out what, what they're actually finding. And they're trying to breed bees that have this super hygienic behavior, which it isn't just a matter of cleaning out the cells or getting rid of the dead larvae that, you know, that failed or whatever, but actually recognizing there's something wrong in there and getting, the, getting them out like the Apis serrana does. And they're having some success, but it turns out to be not a terribly heritable uh, behavior. So you, you breed to it and then you get it and then as soon as you let it loose, it, it's, it's gone in a generation. So now, and then, Another problem is that you, you get all that stuff and then you find out that the bees are so mean you can't stand to have them around anymore, you know, because every time you breed for one thing, then you breed away from something else. Gentleness is something that we, and honey production, those things we valued. And so you have to, it's a complicated thing. It takes generations of good, of good research to do that.
Yeah. Um, what is the danger to putting your hobby high within a mile of commercial highway? Well, there's no real danger. It's just that we ask that you take care of your bees and do the very best you can uh, in controlling mites and, uh, and <laughs> controlling nuisances as well. I have to say that bees can be a real nuisance, in the, especially in the fall. And they're looking for water, and they find everybody's swimming pool, and, they, um, and they're in everybody's water feature and, uh, and stuff. So, um, and if you have swarms, it creates a real, uh, if you let your bees swarm, and I'm going to say, I mean, they have to swarm. They, they want to swarm. It's na natural for them to swarm. But a swarm creates a real ruckus in your neighborhood. Um, and so, you know, there are things like that. Um, people are afraid of bees. And so if you, you know, if you can keep them a little bit out of sight and if you give your honey away to your neighbors to make them a little happier and uh, do your very best to keep your, your bees healthy, um, that's all we can really ask for. Um, we're getting a lot of questions about some product called oxalic acid. Yes. So it is, uh, oxalic acid is basically wood bleach. It's what you clean your deck with. Um, but there are um, packages of pre-dosed oxalic acid with instructions. It is an approved use. EPA has approved it for use. And uh, they have also approved uh, using oxalic acid vapor, that is burning oxalic acid and letting the fumes permeate the hive that's also an approved use, and um, it is commonly used, and it is mentioned in the Varroa Guide. Okay. I just have a question about swarms. Yes. I've got a couple of them. Uh, talk about swarms. Now, if uh, you just let your hive naturally swarm, if you have some boxes that are close by, do they go into that box, or do they go quite a ways away? Usually, they um, will hang pretty close to the hive, but they've got scouts out looking for, and they usually will go a mile or more eventually if you let them decide. Now, if you can get them into a box right away, they have already forgotten where they came from. It, I don't know how that happens, but they do. Um, so if you can, if you, a swarm, you could, and, it, and if, if you happen to know where it came from, you can probably catch that swarm and put it back in on top of the hive that it came from. And it will, uh, almost for sure, it will, uh, it will stay. Sometimes they've al the scouts have already decided, hey, you know, we're going somewhere else. And so you think you have it all taken care of, and then psh, they're gone. But no, um, if, if the timing is right, you can put it in a box and then uh, and put it down um, right away. It's, it's probably almost for sure a good feed. Um, you might want to find a really good beekeeper who's been around for a while and make sure that the colony didn't die from American fowl brood because if that was the case, they'd be able to see from the, pa the brood pattern and there would be telltale there. There are some uh, sampling kits that and places you can send it for a lab analysis. If it was American fowl brood, you would not want to feed that honey to your other hives. But if it, they died from any other, any other virus or mite or starvation or whatever, the honey is just fine. And, and in our climate, a lot of times the pollen and the honey will get mold on it. And within reason, um, a strong colony will be able to clean that up no problem. Um, if it's a very weak colony, they might have a lot of, it's just too much. But uh, yeah, so but I, it's just, I want to make sure that you, you understand what American fowl brood. It used to be, it just ruined the bee industry in the 50s and 60s uh, last century. Uh, in, and it, it's a very contagious disease. We don't see it much anymore because we have antibiotics. But so if, it's, if one hive has it, then they would all have it? Is it that contagious? It's contagious if you were working with, with a hive tool 
in one hive and you could give it to all the rest of your bees just on your hive tool. And feeding honey, the spores are in the honey and they don't, it takes a generation, 100 years for the spores to die. So put it over here, you're just inoculating uh, anything that you feed. But that's the only circumstance. If you didn't have American fowl brood, none of that is the case. None of the other diseases or pests are, are transmittable on, on honey or used comb. Yes? Do you have any reservations against testing on European bees? Uh, yeah. Queens? I mean, as far as attitude, high point production, anything against Okay, so uh, you're talking about the genetics of the queen. Um, so there are a number of different possibilities whenever you buy a queen or get a package or whatever. Uh, you mentioned Russian queens. Um, that was uh, a breeding program that the USDA did where they went to um, eastern Russia and an area where the Apis mellifera had the longest cohabitation with Varroa mites and seemed to be doing just fine without any help. They brought some of them here, quarantined them for a period of time, and then they went into a breeding program. Uh, pretty hard to get Russian stock. Uh, you could get one or two probably. If I wanted to buy a thousand, I couldn't find, there's nobody make, making numbers like that. Um, I, uh, the people who use them swear by them. Uh, and there's a, even a Russian beekeeping association or something like that. You can look it up on, online and uh, check out, see if you could get one. And all I can say is, you know, try it. They do have a reputation for wintering very small clusters. So for commercial uses, that's not, you know, uh, I, I have to meet a standard in order to pollinate almonds. But if you're not involved in that business, then a small cluster would not matter. Uh, very efficient, maybe a little mean. Well, whenever they plant something, uh, and there are a lot of native things, and, and then there are some that are just, uh, you know, plants that are introduced and stuff, but uh, always keep it in your mind, you know, is this going to be attractive? You, you have to do a little homework. Is it attractive? And it's really important that in their gardens that it is a continuous bloom, not of the same thing, but a succession of blooms so that uh, not only honeybees, but uh, all the native bees need you know, they don't need a flush now and then nothing. They need something right through the summer. And so that's something to think about is, you know, that you have a succession to bloom and that you make sure that, you know, uh, except for the ones that you really love because they're really pretty or whatever, you maybe you d plant them because just for that reason. But, uh, you know, in general, you just always think, well, you know, is this going to help or is it going to do nothing? Um, so it does, it's some homework. Does that help? We're going to take like two more questions and then we'll we'll hang out after, but just we'll show you out. And we'll Way in the back. So I have a question about lithium chloride. A lot of people have been talking a little bit about it, about how if there are barrel mites in your bees, that starts to trigger the larva and the brood. Do you have any data to show that? Well, it's interesting how things get spread on the internet. Um, so. In Switzerland, I believe there was a study going on where they were testing uh, RNAi um, genetic uh, control for Varroa, and they um, and so they, it was in a lab, and they noticed that their uh, target, the mites, had died, and then they found that in the control, which had not been given any genetic treatment whatsoever, the mites had died. <laughs> as well. And so what they, you know, scratch their head and they find out that the, uh, one of the uh, background, I don't even know what it was, it was just something that was in both of them was lithium chloride. And then they did some tests and found that lithium chloride, when consumed by bees, um, kills mites. The, um, what the dosage is and what um, the limits of this 
observation are have not been done and absolutely it has not been approved for use by the EPA. So it's a potential bright light. Um, you can buy it. I can buy it. Uh, it doesn't seem to, if you, you just put it in the sugar syrup and the bees eat it. So I mean it sounds like it's a beautiful solution but it's early days. Yeah, one more. Well, you won't be able to see all of what the bees need uh, or can, can actually take advantage of because of all that radius and stuff. But basically, my mentor told me that <laughs> at any one time, um, a hive of bees needs one solid acre of blooming forage. And that has to be not just once, but it has to be continuous. And so, you know, if you're talking about having five hives, then in their flight radius, they're going to have to find five acres of bloom um, that isn't being overwhelmed by somebody else's bees, you know, so it's a lot. I mean, it, it could be just, you know, little in a, in a meadow and stuff, but somehow there has to be quite a bit. <laughs> sure. So I'm having a lot of questions about mason bees. Can you give us an explanation about them? Mason bees are a uh, distant cousin uh, of the honeybee. They are solitary bees, whereas honeybees live in a colony which overwinters and one season to the next and all that, and queen can live for several years, and when she dies, she's replaced, and so the colony itself can live forever. Mason bees, the females, will do all of the work and will go and forage and bring it back, lay an egg and feed it, and then and they, they, they do this in tubes, but each female mason bee is working for herself. And then uh, the, uh, you know, and there's several different varieties. Uh, most of them are native. There are some introduced osmia as well. Um, they usually had, so that then the, the female will die once she's lived her life cycle. And then those tubes will be there and the next year when the right temperature conditions and so forth then they will hatch out one after the other and then there'll be some mating along the line and then each of the females that are are um, are fertilized will then find a tube and start and start laying so um they uh Um, well, they, they need carbohydrate to, and, and protein just like we do, the adults do, and, and they feed carbohydrate and honey to the, or, and protein to the, to the eggs so the larvae have something to eat while they're developing. Um, they're susceptible to a number of diseases, and uh, so people will start them and see them really active the first year, and then they'll wonder how, you know, what happened. And, but, uh, so it's not a, uh, it's not a sure thing either. Um, but, and they're extremely susceptible to pesticides, fungicides and stuff like that. Uh, they just can't take it. So uh, a lot of people will have those cute little boxes and, 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 and won't have a lot of success with them, although they're very, very good pollinators and the different varieties will actually come out and, and will uh, match up with certain seasons. They won't be there all year, but a different uh, species will come out and will will be available at another time of the year and stuff. So um, that's uh, that's pretty sketchy. I'm not a, an expert on on mason bees, but there was at one point a thought that perhaps they could take the place of honeybees if the honeybee populations just collapsed completely. And um, they just found that uh, it would be a big deal to uh, be able to keep get them to overwinter and be. A, available in large enough numbers without disease and so forth is almost as complicated or maybe more complicated than taking care of a hive of bees. So um, anyway, they're, but they're, they're a you know, really neat um, addition to your garden and, and nothing but good, um, but a little bit hard to take care of. I, I, when I say that, they're on their own. I mean, they don't need, you don't, they don't, 
you don't need a spoon feed them or anything. It's just that the diseases are, are a, a real problem. A and they also, some of those wasps you were asking about lay eggs in there and they cannibalize the, the uh, larvae. So pretty interesting. I have one that has a glass top so you can kind of see the, each tube and stuff and so you can kind of see them filling up and my grandkids just were fascinated with them and stuff and were really devastated when they saw that none of the larvae um, survived. That's it. We're good. We'll talk a little bit, and Matthew, you, you raise your hand where you're at. Matthew can answer some questions as well. He's a beekeeper that works with Coastal. Um, one thing, a lot of you guys might have showed up and are interested in starting your bees this year. Um, if you're going to do that, you need to get your packages ordered, um, like right now. Uh, there's a limited supply. This year's been a really hard year for bees. Um, you can talk with George about it. Commercial beekeepers have lost a lot of, a lot of their hives. And so they're ordering a bunch of the queens that will come in that you're going to need to make packages. So with that being said, you'll want to get your orders in as fast as you can because there is a limited supply and they're going to sell out. Um, Coastal has them right now for $129.99. It's a decent price. They'll come in around April 15th, two weeks before or two weeks after. All that's going to come on because of the almond bloom. Um, it's coming a little bit faster, but queen supply is going to make that happen um, or dictate when your package is going to come. Where does the queens come from? The queens are going to be coming from Conan's, it sounded like, out of Northern California. Um, Wolf Fork Apiaries is actually one that they're going to be making the packages. They're out of Washington. Um, you'll have a lot, there's a misconception on this. You say this on the internet, like George was saying, a lot of people say, well, I'm going to get my bees local. Well, you don't have local bees, you have local beekeepers. So um, support your local beekeepers, that's a big thing. Um, if you guys want to help just with honeybees, major thing is Project Apis and a lot of people will come and say, hey, we just heard that there's a problem with, with going on with honeybees. Um, one of the major things that you can do is, is support like Project, Ape, Project Apis and because they plant forage. So go to their site, make a donation. If you guys like seeing this and what we brought George in, it's those donations that make that happen. We donate to them. And what our plan is with Malibo partnering and, and working with Project Ape to Sim is to take you through a full season. So this seminar is going to be the first of many. I'm supposed to be down in the almonds next week. We'll show you where your bees are at this point that are going to be coming to a package. And our goal is to really bridge the gap between commercial and hobby beekeepers. Um, so I've had a, some comments online that were saying, hey, this is a really beginning course, and it is right here for this seminar. But we're going to go in depth, and there's going to be some really good information for the people that are into it to commercial beekeepers as well. That's our goal. Um, and once again, like I said, this is a continuing course. We'll take you through the whole season, hopefully into bringing uh, bees into wintering and then taking them into the almonds again next year. And thank you, Coastal, for putting this together. Thank you, George, for coming out. And thank you, Project A for Send. Thank all of you guys for showing up. And I hope you guys have a good night. Thank you.